So my question to you this morning, how is your love life? How is your walk with God that you demonstrate vigorously your devotion to Christ in your love to him? How do you demonstrate and show the capacity to love those in the household of faith? How do you show your concern, going the extra mile in loving your enemies? You see, in the body of Christ, Love sums up everything that we are to be. It shows how we are. It's the thermometer of the church. How we to love sincerely. How we to love wholly the whole body of Christ. Love is to be without hypocrisy. Love reveals the greatest attribute of God. That God is love. The greatest evidence of this vibrant personal salvation is that we love God with all the, our strength and soul and might and being. That's the greatest commandment. That's what was de declared in this service. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? in Matthew's Gospel, to be tested by a Pharisee. And Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. That's the greatest commandment. That is how we are to live day by day under the love of God. That's what the Apostle Jude tells us to do. Keep yourself in the love of God. There's no greater attribute than the love of God. There's no greater quality than the love of God. So I firmly suggest to you this day that the way you express your devotion to God is seen in how you love your neighbour as yourself. I don't know, was any of you challenged by what you read on the sign behind us? Jesus said, this is a commandment and I give you that you should love one another as what? I have loved you. So I have loved you. How's Christ loved you? Hey? Eh? Well, the way Christ has loved you is the way you and I are meant to love one another. It's challenging enough words that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Can I suggest as a fellowship that when people come into this place, not only to sense the presence of God, but there should be a current, an ocean of the love of God that just hits them because they see how we interface in the love of God. That's what they need to see. That's what they need to taste. You see, Paul was writing to the Galatians, he said, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom for an opportunity of the flesh, but through love serve one another. 
for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And then he says this staggering statement. I think he's got it wrong, you know. Seriously, he's got it wrong. It's all fulfilled in this one statement, he says. Oh, Paul, you love God. You have your quiet time. You have your devotions. You're out and out for Christ. You attend the place of worship. You pray. You read your word. Does he say that? No, he doesn't. He said the whole law of God is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You want to show how much you love God this morning? You want to be devoted to God this morning? You want to be passionate about God this morning? It's not just how long you spend on your knees, it's how you serve one another. It's how you give yourself to the body of Christ. It's how you give yourself to the community in West Norwood. And Paul says that's how you fulfill the law of God. It's vitally important how we interact with each other demonstrates our heart's desire to God. So we turn to Luke chapter 10, which Debbie read for us. Behold, a lawyer stood and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> and Jesus says, how do you see the law? What? What? How do you see the law? Oh, why isn't Jesus going to say, oh, well, actually, my dear friend, you need to, uh, you need to have faith in me. Uh, you need to look to the cross of Christ, and that is true. But Jesus wants to open up this man to his real need. That's why he asks him, how do you see the law? And the guy knows the scripture. This guy knows the scripture. He says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says this. You've answered correctly. Do this. Do this and you will live. What? What? Do this and you will live? Yeah, you fulfill the law of God perfectly, you will live. But there's a catch. There's a catch. And this is what Jesus, he's, can I say it, set the trap. And this man's going to be caught. He set the trap. Because as we're going to see in a few minutes, this guy didn't really love God with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. This guy portrayed that, but he didn't live it. Ooh. Do you portray that or do you live it? You see, people have said to me in the past, and I've heard it said, it's not your, it's not your talk, it's your walk. I would say it's your walk and your talk. Both are vitally important. But this man wanted to justify himself. That's what it says. He wanted to justify himself. And design, so he was, he was being a smart aleck. He was being a bit cocky. Maybe there was the other scribes and Pharisees around him. He said, now I'll get him. Who is my neighbour? 
Because he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to look good. Who is my neighbour? So this morning, I got three headings because then Jesus answers this scribe's question. So today we see the godless scribe, the good Samaritan, and the great Samaritan. Any guess who the great Samaritan is? The godless scribe. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. There was no, no devotion to God in this question. In fact, what this scribe was showing was he didn't love his neighbour as himself. Who was his neighbour at that very moment? It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he try and do? He tries to hoodwink him, catch him out by deception. And he tries to cause Jesus, if he could, to slip up. And at the same time, make himself look good. Who is my neighbour? You see, this scribe was a godless man. He was a religious man, but he was a godless man. He knew about Jesus. He had heard Jesus' teachings. He knew what sort of man Jesus was. In fact, again and again and again, Jesus had clearly demonstrated his righteous attributes. He had shown he was a man of integrity and wholeness. But instead of embracing that, it made the Pharisees mad. You read the Gospels again and again and again. They try and test Jesus, try to catch him out, try trying to catch his words and cause him to stumble. He looked to justify himself. You see, the problem with this man was he was self-righteous. He looked good on the outside, but he was full of dead men's bones, says Jesus. He was a whitewashed sepulchre. He could fool others, but there was no fooling Jesus. I mean, this man had a selective disorder when it came to who was his neighbour. You read the people that the Pharisees were interested in, and you see the people who Jesus was interested in, there was a huge chasm of difference. I mean, Jesus gives a parable about this. He describes the Pharisee, the self-righteous man. He said there was two men who went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, undust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Just look at him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes all, all that I get. But this tax collector, standing afar off, could not even lift his eyes to heaven and beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you the truth. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be 
exalted. Outwardly, this Pharisee performed well. We would like him at Lansdowne. Ooh, I tithe. I pray. I do this. I do that. He may hoodwink all of us, but he would not hoodwink the living God. You see, Jesus says these words, that he did not come, as it were, to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came to show what the real measure of the law of God is. He really threw the spanner in the works. He just opened up this man. In fact, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. I, you see, I don't know everybody here. You may be all born again believers, hallelujah if you are. But maybe you're here today. You've got the outward appearance, but you don't have the inward reality of knowing Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you know him as your saviour? Have you put your trust in him? Is he your Lord? And also we've got to say that this, this man had such selective disorder because again and again and again and again you read in the Gospels that the Pharisees said something to Jesus. They mocked him and ridiculed him and they said, this man... This man eats with sinners. Eats with sinners. He had a selective disorder on who his neighbour was. You see, the Pharisee was mm, into Mr. Respectable outwardly. He was sort of into Mr. Middle Class. He was into the person that looked good. Maybe he was the uh, businessman in the city. Ho, ho, ho. Let's get him in. Canary Wolf guy. What I would call, because I grew up in the 70s, Mr. Milk Tray Man. Looks the part. Got the designer stubble. Got the best Italian suit. That's the man that the Pharisee went after. Is that the man we go after? I trust not. Okay, brilliant. If Mr... Milk train man comes in because milk train man needs the gospel too. Amen. Needs to be saved. Think of Zacchaeus who was saved. He was a rich man by extortion. He was a rich man, but Jesus' had, heart was for him. Because as we're going to see, loving your neighbor is just more than Mr. Milk train man. Well, that's what the Pharisees, he had a selective disorder in who his neighbour really was. Do you have a selective disorder in who your neighbour is? Is your neighbour just your friends? Maybe some of your work colleagues. You see, if that's the case, and it's the case with all of us, I'm afraid to say, including myself, we can all be a bit of a Pharisee in our treatment of others. And Jesus wants to purge that from this man and from us as well. This proud Pharisee was 
powerless to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law of God. He was powerless. You see, the law actually uh, reveals to us that we have not lived a perfect life. Far from it. That daily we break the commandments of God. That we don't come anywhere near fulfilling the righteous requirements of God's law that reveals the holiness of God. We don't come anywhere near. We don't love God as we should. We confessed it in our meeting. We don't love our neighbor as ourselves. I was reminded of this recently in my work. We fail and come short. But that's, in, that's what the law is intended to do. It's to reflect how holy God is and how sinful we are. Do you have a sin issue? This morning, each one of us does. That's why we need to confess our sins. But good news is he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus' words, do you think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets? I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not jot or tittle pass from the law until it is accomplished. And the only one who ever accomplished the law of God is the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. We glory in the cross, and rightly so. My dear friends, we need glory in the life of Christ as well. Because Christ fulfilled every single aspect that we have failed in keeping the commandments of God. Every aspect. So actively and passively, Jesus fulfilled every righteous thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now Jesus turns the screw on this Pharisee. Now he reveals to him what it is to truly walk the life of love. We see the good Samaritan. We've seen the godless Scribe, now we see the good Samaritan as Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem, to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed him, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, a Levite, huh? when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But when a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and saw him. He had compassion and he went to him and bound up his wounds and pouring oil and wine and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, took care of him and the next day he gave two denarii, two days wages I believe that is, two days wages, saying to the keeper, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Wow. Interesting. We don't know who the guy was who was half dead, who had been beaten up left half dead. This man could be a man who had been maybe stabbed in the street. That brings it back a little bit, doesn't it? 
And maybe people, instead of calling the police or calling the ambulance service, get out their mobile phone and start recording it. Yeah? First of all, a priest comes by. Well, maybe we can understand that. Dare I say this? Dare I say it? And the pastor went by and went on the other side. Okay. Dare I say it? The Levite and the trustee went by and went on the other side. You see, Jesus is using the most significant religious leaders of the time. But then he used the most despised and hated person of the time. Do you remember James and John? They were going through Samaria and uh, they weren't interested in Jesus. Then you find out why they're called the sons of thunder. Lord, shall we call fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Not the sort of fire we were hearing about from Brother Ken. And Jesus said, you do not know what spirit you're speaking in. You see, what it really shows that Jewish people had no time for Samaritans. Samaritans didn't really have a lot of time for Jewish people. Who's this man lying in the road? This man lying in the road or could be the Hamas terrorist. And who's the guy that comes to his aid? Is the Israeli soldier who goes beyond racial hatred and binds up his wounds. This could be the man, a man from Ukraine lying on the floor and a Russian soldier showing humanity and pity and compassion. How relevant is this passage to us in London? You see, my friends, I'm not saying it's wrong that 400 people should be banged up in prison for being far right. I'm not saying it's wrong. But I tell you what would be better is a transformed heart by the gospel of Christ where people's hearts are changed that instead of hatred and racial animosity, there is the love of Christ and the love of God poured out in their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that is the transforming effect of the gospel? Do you believe that's what Jesus Christ gives? You don't sound too sure. That's what he gives. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, says Paul. We have the capacity, brothers and sisters, to love. To love our enemies. Really? Seriously? Yes, pray for those who spitefully use you. Pray for those who abuse you. That is what the challenge is. I was listening to a YouTube the other day. Uh, the guy from Frasers is a Christian. He said the most powerful words he ever has heard from anybody and he's only ever heard it from one man in history is Jesus Christ when he said you shall love your enemies that's the call of discipleship that's what we're called to be
I mean, the heart of God is to always be to help those who are afflicted and poor and needy. Even in the Old Testament, we read this. It's not the fast I've chosen, says Isaiah, to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, October the 6th? And bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover him. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn. And your healing like the spring up speedily. Your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Again in Leviticus, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shouldn't do him no wrong. You don't burn down the hotel. You should do him no wrong. You should treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you. You should love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. What should our hearts be towards those who are asylum seekers, refugees, orphans, the poor, widow? It's stopping the boats. No, it's not. It's loving your neighbour as yourself. It's having a heart in them. One of the greatest things that I had greatest pleasure when I was working in Hestia was I saw this young man who came over from Eritrea and glory to God for this. This young man was homeless. He was, um, he was tortured in his country. He had nowhere uh, to live. He had no resources. And it was a privilege to find him a home. It was a privilege for him to get aid. It's a privilege to see him have hope for the future. That's loving your neighbour as yourself. Who is this helpless, beaten man? He's vulnerable, unable to help himself, destitute on the street corner, bypassed, overlooked. I would say this, but I'm going to chicken out. I'm going to let the man who said it, said it. Though he's dead, he still speaks. Tim Keller says these words. If you do not have a heart for the poor, then you do not have the heart of Jesus. Do you get that? If you do not have a heart for the poor, then you do not have the heart for Jesus. Jesus says this, he said to also men who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or those your rich neighbours, least they invite you in return and you are repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you but you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just i don't know about you i'm i i'm not trying to boast about what i'm doing. please forgive me i'm not trying to do that i've tried to help the poor and i've been ripped off 
Seriously, I have. But what Jesus tells us is that we're called to go the extra mile. If you're giving your tunic, don't grumble that you haven't got it back. Jesus says you want to give the other one as well. Huh? Whew. You see, when we come to express the love of God, when has it ever not been costly or sacrificial? You see, I'm going to sound like Martin Luther now, Martin Luther King. I love that guy. That guy was just phenomenal. And he, he did a great speech. I have a dream. I just love that speech. But I have a dream. I have a dream that the love of God may so possess us by the power of the Holy Spirit that we will see this church, this community, this city transformed by the love of God. Is that possible? Dare you dream it? Dare you pray it? That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about reaching out to every single person in the community. He's not letting us off the hook on this. Now it may be one person at the time, like this Samaritan with this other guy. It may be that we can only do good for one person, but please do good for one person. That's what he's asking. Again, in Luke's Gospel, Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, okay. Sell your possessions. What? Give to the needy. Provide yourselves in money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where there the thief approaches and no moth destroys. Hello. For where your treasure is, that will be where your heart is also. Dear friends, I'm not knocking us doing a harvest service. I pray not only will this platform be filled, it will be filled to there, to there. But let's not just do it yearly, folks. Yeah, let's give to Brixton Food Bank. Can I suggest maybe let us do our own food bank? We've got homeless people in this area. We've got people who are poor and needy in this area. I could take you to them. That's the call of Jesus. We are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The great preacher Jonathan Edwards, I wish Lawrence was here, he would have liked this bit. Jonathan Edwards, preaching on loving your neighbour. He mentions neighbour 60 times in his sermon. In the word, our duties are to the poor, an issue that he was dealing with. And addressing one of the most profound sermons on the Good Samaritan, Edwards states, we ought to have such a spirit of love as to him that we should be afflicted with him and his that's literally Christ's afflictions and walk in our shoes and enter into our afflictions. Edward states, if we claim we have nothing to spare or do not have any help anymore, Edward says we have lost what it is to minister the gospel. We are called to help. 
and carry the burden and take that burden upon ourselves if we are to call to relieve the burden of other burdens when we can do it without burdening ourselves how then can we be people's neighbours and bear their burdens if we have no burden at all ourselves in other words we are to go the extra mile even if it pinches in our wallet our food cabinet or our church but if you need more convincing folks we see lastly the great Samaritan the great Samaritan who's the great Samaritan answers for 10 give me an answer someone oh Debbie knows brilliant the Lord Jesus Christ he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law Jesus loved his neighbor as himself he loved everyone he loved his enemies the two criminals on the cross as he was led to death when they came to the place that's called the skull there they crucified him and the criminals one on the right one on the left the greatest travesty of injustice the world has ever seen yes yes definitely so what does Jesus do father father forgive them for they know not what they do here's the son of God crucified on the cross of Calvary bearing the weight of sin sin of the world all of my transgressions all of my sins all of your sins and on that cross he cries out father forgive them for they know what they do for while we were still helpless at the right time Christ died for the ungodly for one would hardly dare to die for a righteous man though maybe for a good man someone may even dare to die but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners Christ died for us much more having been justified by his blood we are saved from the wrath of God through him for while we were still enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more having been reconciled shall we be saved by his life whilst we are still enemies maybe you've come here this morning and you're an enemy of Jesus Christ because you do not know him I want to tell you here in this passage Jesus died for those who are his enemies to give them the opportunity that they may find eternal life and forgiveness of sin in him do you have life in Christ if you're an enemy of Christ today I urge you to come to Jesus Christ today do not delay don't put it off come to him today bow a knee confess your sin confess that like this poor man that was at the side of the road you're wretched naked poor and blind and you need someone to come and rescue you from your sin Edward says Christ loved us and was kind to us 
and willing to relieve us though we were very hateful persons and evil in disposition and not deserving any good so we will be willing to be kind to those who are undeserving I don't know what it is about us I'm guilty as well people hurt us and offend us and we find it so hard to forgive them but when you think of the enormity in which we've been forgiven we need to be forgiving the grace of God has come to us it's bound up our wounds it's healed our broken hearts and we need to do what the Samaritan did to this poor wretched man at the side of the road. Whether physically, emotionally, but definitely spiritually. We need to come to the dysfunctional, the broken hearted. I mean, Jesus went after tax collectors, prostitutes and sinners. Christ receives Sinful men. Why? Because Jesus loves his neighbor as he loves himself. So who is under our radar when it comes to our neighbor? And the simple answer is this. Everyone. There's no race that should be excluded. There's no age. There's no, dare I say it, sexuality when it comes to looking to meet the needs of the poor and give them the gospel. None. I need to tell you what is so wonderful about the church of Jesus Christ is that there's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor bond, nor free, black, white, Asian, people from Africa, people from the Dominican Republic, people from Thailand, people from the Philippines, people from Ghana, you know what country you come from. You're loved by the love of Christ, aren't you? The same justifying faith that I have is the same justifying faith you have. Hallelujah. we got more that unites us than should divide us. My dear friends, whoever comes through these doors, wherever they're from, they should come to a position and a place where they can see, I can receive the love of God in Jesus Christ. And each one of us has the ability and the capacity to be that channel. So when Jesus asked the question, who do you think was the neighbour to this proud Pharisee? He had no option but to say the one who showed mercy. And his answer is my sermon application. And finally, and it is finally, go and do likewise. Amen.